Welcome to Classics Confidential on location in New York on the occasion of the American Comparative Literature Conference. I'm talking with Philip Walsh of Washington College who has organized our seminar on the reception of Greek tragedy. So Phil, um, you're also working on a book about the reception of um, Aristophanes. Aristophanes, yes. Um, yeah, it's a part of it's it's called the Brill's Companion to the Reception of Aristophanes. It's part of a new series uh, that Bill Brill has uh, put together on the reception of ancient authors, um, uh, philosophical uh, figures, um, sort of a history of ideas, intellectual history, that type of thing. And it's really exciting, um, and um, you know, my particular volume on Aristophanes is uh, is exclusively focused on instances of reception, so uh, both ancient and modern, and I think that's what is, is new and uh, what contributes, I think, to the ongoing conversation about the reception of Greek drama, um, is that this volume and all the volumes that, that Brill is publishing um, are focused just on the reception of these uh, ancient texts, ancient figures. Fantastic, and we're going to hear some papers today. That's right, yeah, this conference, uh, this, this panel at the ACLA was, was organized by myself and my colleague, uh, Greg Baker, uh, Catholic University, uh, and uh, we had just started thinking about um, you know, new ways, are there new ways at this, I think, relatively mature point in reception studies of the classics, uh, um, are there new ways to uh, get at essential questions yeah. uh, about dramatic texts, about, but not just dramatic texts though, I think most often uh, conversations center around drama and performance yeah. and uh, uh, theatrical studies of that sort. Um, Could I ask, um, uh, are you going to contribute a chapter to the Companion? Yeah, so it's, 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 it's an ambitious project and we're still about <laughs> a year away from uh, the reception or the, re the receipt of, of, of draft chapters, uh, so it's still a moment of possibility, a moment of, of enthusiasm. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's going to be a pretty robust volume, about 20 chapters, um, 8 to 10,000 words roughly. Um, so I'll write an introduction as as well as a chapter on the British literary and uh, well, the, the, uh, the reception of Aristophanes in, in 19th century British literary culture. Oh, fabulous. That would be very interesting. Um, do you have any idea um, uh, about uh, the case studies that you're going to be exploring? Yeah, no, uh, in my particular chapter, yeah, sure. My, I, I, I perceive, I mean, there's been uh, quite a bit of work on uh, 19th century British reception, um, uh, Anglophonic mm -hmm. reception more generally in Britain and America, uh, on, on, and even on Aristophanes in particular. There's the volume Aristophanes and performance mm -hmm. from several years ago. Yes. Um, there, there are chapters and, and essays here and there that touch on different aspects of, of the reception, whether it's translation mm -hmm. um, or... or my, actually, uh, I, I've published uh, an essay in Classical Receptions mm -hmm. Journal on um, that really does focus on 19th century conversations about Aristophanes' politics and influence um, uh, in the first uh, first volume of, of, of CRJ, which you know, has its own <laughs> abbreviation now, which suggests its, its permanent place uh, in the conversation having to do with reception. But uh, So my, my chapter, as I envision it, will be a survey um, uh, of sort of conversations surrounding the, the reputation of Aristophanes uh, in the 19th century and I think what's interesting by in, sense, in a sense of contrast how that reputation has really shifted in 2014 versus say you know 1814 yes. uh, where there are certain plays that were read and studied and appreciated uh, but many other plays uh, that we certainly value now uh, were ignored, yeah, so. uh, were repudiated. <laughs> Uh, criticized for, for various things. So there will be a section on that. Um, I'll treat again the question of politics and influence because it really is one of the seminal questions Absolutely. that that emerges in the 19th century, particularly as uh, democracy itself is being debated in, yeah. in, in a live voice uh, at this moment in time. Um, there'll be a section on adaptations uh, most likely um, uh, and then I think ending the chapter with, with Aubrey Beardsley's illustrations of the Lysistrata, which are notorious and cheeky yes. uh, and perverted and strange, <laughs> but also I think uh, do capture something about uh, the nature of that particular mm -hmm. play. Um, and that's actually something I'll, I'll speak about here at, at this weekend's uh, panel. Fantastic.
Um, now, Phil, you work in a liberal arts college that doesn't actually have a program in classics. What's that like? Well, I did my uh, undergraduate degree in classics uh, once upon a time at the College of William & Mary, uh, and I received an amazing education uh, in the languages and also in the civilization and history. And then after that, I took a couple years off uh, and I worked as a software designer of all things. Uh, uh, in the moment in time when a classics major could get a job uh, with a uh, major consulting firm. Um, and then I went back to graduate school at Brown where I did my PhD in comparative literature. Uh, so I'm, uh, I bridge two different disciplines, but really I don't think that that's, uh, you know, it's in some ways it's an artificial uh, firewall between classics and comparative literature. Um, you know, it actually sort of gets at my own notion of what reception studies can be moving forward, that reception should embrace, and I think classics as a field should embrace uh, the types of things that we do, yes. not only in terms of the methodologies of our work, but also uh, in terms of out outreach uh, and, um, and, and uh, sort of maintaining public and vital conversations about, about the classical world. Um, so anyway, so my PhD is in comparative literature, and then uh, my wife and I moved to Washington College, which is in Chestertown, Maryland, a lovely part of the world in the eastern shore of Maryland. Uh, where we both teach and work, um, and I teach out of an English department. Um, since we don't have at, at our small little school a classics department or a program in comparative literature or anything like that, but uh, the English department uh, has warmly embraced me, uh, and and I do things uh, that uh, are a little bit different, right? Because I, I can teach Latin, um, and I have taught Latin for five years. I'm teaching Greek for the first time next year, hey, uh, which I'm very fun. excited about. Uh, and uh, but also, you know, I do all the other other types of courses, uh, you know, everything from you know, first year writing seminars uh, to uh, sort of the intermediate level surveys of classical literature and drama uh, to occasional upper level courses and, and we have a small graduate program, master's program uh, in, in history and, and in English. Uh, so I've, I've contributed to the history one uh, most recently. Uh, so I do lots of different things. I think that's actually, again, um, I credit my teachers, uh, my training both in classics and in complete, uh, that have allowed me to do such things. Yeah, to be diverse and to be able to fit into a number of different um, streams of teaching. Absolutely. Well, I think at, at small schools in particular, and this, uh, I'm, I'm not as familiar with the Europe European system, but you know, it's it's in some ways the small liberal arts college is a hallmark of, of American education. It's uh, this idea is about as old as the the, the nation itself. Washington College is one of the oldest colleges uh, in, in America. I think it's like number 10 or 11 or something like that, 1782, when it was founded. Um, and so we have, uh, we're very much a part of um, the conversation about American life, about our history, our culture, um, and, how, um, and how we educate our youth. It really is a timeless question. Right? What is the best way to, uh, to educate the youth? Um, and so in this small, liberal arts college with limited resources, um, you know, our hallmark is our smallness. Um, so we don't have the uh, expansive research halls or laboratories, um, the huge lecture buildings. Um, you know, our classes are, are, are capped often at, you know, 16, 20, 25 students. I think the biggest class on our campus is, you know, 75. Um, and that's very unusual. Yeah. Um, so at a place like that, you really need to be able to do lots of different things. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and also to very self-consciously think about what we do in the classroom every day. And this is how I think it relates very much to, uh, to classics and to reception. Um, that in an era of relative economic austerity, of, of cutbacks, mm -hmm. uh, of the questioning of the value of the humanities, uh, we need to do more and more. And we have to be very, more, we have to be much more self-conscious and vocal uh, about the things that we bring to the table. Indeed, because I mean, classics is no longer, you know, part of the core uh, subjects. Ironically, it used to yeah. be um, in the old days. So we really have to um, prove ourselves and, um, you know, s explain why we are still relevant today. Yeah. Do you think that um, classical reception is um, one of the ways in which we could do that? Uh, in which we could uh, say, well, look, you know, the classics are still alive today. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's not a dead subject. It's it's very much uh, absolutely. Present. I think it has. Uh, I like to think of reception studies, and I'm going to borrow a phrase from my colleague Will mm -hmm. Sharon, who is also here at our conference. He teaches at the University of Miami. He and I were just talking about the Big Tent. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, we need to 
be in the business of big tents, um, whether we're classicists or comparatists, um, I think uh, uh, lovers of the humanities in general, we need to uh, embrace. And that's not to say we lose critical rigor um, or we lower our standards, but we do have to think very much about um, the nature of the game mm -hmm. in 2014. Um, and uh, I think that everything that I do, uh, even in the classroom, is a moment of reception, mm -hmm. where I'm trying to explain um, you know, the, the, the foggy details of the beginning of the Peloponnesian War as we open a conversation about Euripides' Medea, for instance. Um, and then, of course, um, having students think about you know, what drives this uh, tortured woman yeah. to do what she does, and can we align it to um, you know, some of the things that, that we see in our news. Mm -hmm. um, uh, most recently in America, there was a, a, a woman who drove her van into uh, the Atlantic Ocean at Daytona Beach, uh, a van full of, I think, three children. Um, and right as we were reading Euripides' Medea, and of course the context is different, uh, the, her, the circumstances are different. Uh, we, it, you know, in the modern in the modern world, we can psychology we can psychologize uh, we, uh, uh, disorders, or uh, we try to understand things from from that point of view. But I asked them, you know, how would the Greeks have addressed such a thing? Right? Uh, would it be? madness inspired by the gods? Would it have been, in Medea's case, sort of this you know, her mythological, um, uh, the, you know, the history of, of, her, of her house, you know, the house of, uh, of which she is a part? So, and, and students really, you know, that's, that's, when the moment, that's when the connections are made, and that's when they understand, okay, the, I, this is a, a, a classical text that I've never read before, but I can bring it into my own world. Mm -hmm. I can use my own language, perhaps a psychology major using the language of psychology. Um, you know, reading, say, a play like Ajax, mm -hmm. right? PTSD, which yes. of course is very much, you know, it's been talked about. Yes. Um, and so that's, I think, a moment where um, we can really make the classics mm -hmm. live. Um, and students of psychology, students of science, um, literary people as well, can mm -hmm. can take those moments of insight with them and, and into whatever it is they happen to do. Yeah, so that the conversation can be inclusive Absolutely. For, for everyone. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, in a way, reception covers pretty much everything. I would like to think, and, so and exciting. Uh, I think it, and that's a provocative notion mm -hmm. uh, that uh, you know, classics as reception studies, uh, uh, teaching as moments mm -hmm. of reception, um, and uh, it's something I believe I might have to, mm -hmm. to, to really think about it and figure it out some more. Um, but in some ways, we have to we have to do everything that we can. Yes. Um, and. It's, and, and fortunately for us, our raw materials are so vital. They're mm -hmm. so wonderful and deep and thought-provoking and timeless um, uh, that it's, it's up to us as really the voices of, of this generation, uh, teachers uh, and professors in classrooms uh, from, you know, from the middle school level up mm -hmm. uh, to really make uh, a place for classics and really for literary studies mm -hmm. in general. So in, in a way, uh, losing our privileged position um, can actually uh, make us think anew about the best way to teach our subject. So, you know, we could turn it into um, a positive... Yeah, I'd like to think, I mean, in this moment, I, it is what it is. And instead of, of being cynical, instead of being negative, mm -hmm. uh, let's, let's try to make the best of it. Uh, and perhaps we make it in road. Uh, perhaps the classics can remain vital to the next generation. Uh, the folks that we're, we're that we teach in the classroom right now, yeah. um, and you know, really, it, not just classroom, um, performance spaces, mm. uh, uh, coffee houses, yeah. uh, you know, have, having poetry readings. Uh, you know, our, our college is blessed with a literary house uh, where you know, these conversations can happen. I actually teach my class in this uh, uh, unusual mm. uh, academic space. It's not a classroom; it's more just uh, it's a porch, really, and, and uh, we sit and talk uh, from Homer to we're actually going to start reading. Archilochus and Sappho this week, Fantastic. So, in translation, but still, uh, you know, great opportunity to mm -hmm. to make the classics fresh. Fantastic. And on that positive note, thank you very much for talking to us on Classics Confidential, Phil. Thank you very much, Anastasia.